everyone, and welcome to our first strawberry chat of the year. My name is Miranda Purcell. I'm the Viticulture Extension Specialist at Purdue University, and my co-host is Dr. Wayne Jing Guan, who I will introduce here in a second. I wanted to welcome everyone to Strawberry Chat, which is a monthly discussion on various aspects of strawberry production at small scale, diver diversified, and local farms. My name is Wen Jing Guan. I'm a horticulture specialist from the Horticulture and Landscape Architecture Department of Purdue University. Miranda and I are the program's host. Today, we will discuss spring disease and management. Our special guest is Dr. Jenna Beckman. Jenna, could you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Jana Beckerman. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the extension plant pathologist who focuses on specialty crops. And strawberries are just one of the, the crops that I've been working with since I've been at Purdue. I know our listeners are eager to hear from you on this topic, um, especially after last year's astragnose fruit rot problem at some of our farms. Um, so I'd like to start our discussion with this disease. The first question, Jenna, could you tell us more about the basic biology of the passage that causes astragnose fruit rot? Sure, that's a, a great jumping off point. And uh, it's important to recognize that anthracnose is a disease with a single name, but that there are actually hundreds of species of fungus that cause this problem. They all happen to belong to the same genus of Colitotricum, uh, which gets a little bit confusing because you wouldn't normally expect such a diversity of different pathogens being able to cause the, the same disease problem. Uh, and it turns out that when you look at this, most of the time you'll see this nice, uh, well, I think as a pathologist, this lovely orange ooze. But when we look at these things uh, underneath the microscope, there are size differences. And then when we look at their DNA, it turns out even though uh, to the naked eye or even microscopically, they look similar, but it turns out there are literally dozens of different species that are causing our anthracnose there. And just show you this, this life cycle, uh, all of our anthracnose fungi, uh, Colitotricum species have this similar life cycle. Many growers, unfortunately, are getting this disease coming in on uh, their uh, plugs or new transplants, and uh, which is unfortunate. We're going to talk about how we can uh, try to mitigate that. But once it gets in there, um, those young disease transplants, uh, young disease transplants, end up spreading it. It also ends up coming into new plantings if they didn't happen to. If you didn't bring the disease in in the first place, any sort of nearby weeds can serve as a source for the disease to get in there. If you have any nearby infected crops, and this is where it gets even more confusing, uh, anthracnose, the anthracnose fungi are not specific to just strawberries. And in fact, they will. Uh, there's a lot of overlap between these pathogens that are also capable of infecting peppers sometimes, or tomatoes, or apples, or blueberries. So if you are growing, uh, oh, and melons as well, if you are growing any of these other crops, it's really important to make sure that you're managing for anthracnose, or in the case of apples, bitter rot, uh, on all of your crops. Because we wanna try and make sure very early on that the fungus cannot get established. And when we talk about why certain uh, management strategies fail, more often than not, what happened is it wasn't the management strategy, but that it was implemented too late. So it was the timing. And if we don't stop this early introduction, what happens under wet, warm, humid conditions can be explosive. Uh, and the fungus will rapidly produce a lot of spores. Those little round dots actually consist of hundreds to thousands of spores. Those aren't the spores themselves. Those are just the beginnings of the oozing tendrils. And those hundreds to thousands of spores from a single lesion can end up splashing or be uh, spread by insects 
all throughout your entire planting, where under every wet uh, weather event, the disease can spread further. Genesis, so my understand right, in you said the passage initially could come from planting materials, or it could come from nearby weeds or other crops. Okay, now I was imagine if it's do coming from planting materials, will they cause symptoms immediately, or like they may be um, there if the environment is not suitable is that possible like because we see the fruit rot the extracted fruit rot in the spring so that to me is a long time if it come from planting materials for the last year where that where are these passages are so that's, that's the a really good time. question very good question so in some instances uh it's been found that this fungus can live as an epiphyte which is a fancy way of saying it can live within the plant, but it isn't gonna actually show any symptoms of disease. So the plant might look fairly healthy. Uh, it will also come in uh, on any dead material that is associated with your plant. It um, Obviously when we get uh, dormant uh, bare root cuttings, there are oftentimes leaves that are also dead and the Colatotricum fungus can be living on those leaves uh, or in the, the nearby plant material. Uh, and as I said, it could also be asymptomatically infecting plants. In addition to that, if you're planting into the same berry patch, if you have any uh, previous uh, plants or runners or weeds, the fungus can overwinter and persist there as well. This isn't, there are a few diseases if it gets really cold over the winter that the climate will kill the pathogen. Unfortunately for us, anthracnose is one, not one of those diseases. So once you get it into a planting, it's not gonna go away anytime soon, which is one of the reasons that rotating out of your berry patch every few years is, is strongly encouraged. Jenna, now we realize it's possible those plants coming from planting materials. I'm assuming nurseries is do, trying to do their best job to control that, prevent it. Um, but it, it, that, it, it, my understanding is that it's impossible, like they can scout all the plants to prevent this passage. And so there's, may still have the risk. Is, is that the case? That, that's exactly the case. So one of the problems with plant pathogens, unlike insects, you know, for insects, you can find the insect. They're, they're for the most part, visible to the naked eye. You can screen through a lot of plants very quickly. Whereas for plant pathogens, uh, I guess the example I'm thinking of when an entomologist is trying to scout for plants, they might put a white paper plate underneath the plant and bang the plant against the white paper plate to see what insects fall out. And that way they can quickly determine if a plant is infested or not. If we did that with a plant disease, nothing's going to happen. So we don't have any quick and dirty way of determining it. Plus, as I talked about earlier, all you need is one lesion, like what we have right here. And within that one lesion, you could easily have 10,000 to 100,000, 500,000 spores. So it doesn't take much to, to spread everything everywhere. So getting something that's absolutely uh, pristine or getting all of your plants from a nursery that is absolutely pristine is become, I, I would say it's it's all but impossible, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next, you, you, you already mentioned this a little bit, Jenna, is the environment. We know the disease triangle for disease to happen, we have the inoculator environment and the plants. So can you see, see a little bit more of the most favorable condition for Australia? Absolutely. So, and the so actually, I would say that uh, strawberry anthracnose has uh, two situations that favor the disease. The first situation is going to be those spring freezes that we have with increasing regularity in Indiana. And I say that because that ends up damaging the plant and creating all of this dead tissue and wounds 
for the fungus to get a foothold in. So that would be the first environmental condition that favors anthracnose. But the big one that most of us respond to and see is when the temperature is warm and it's it's wet, usually uh, a warm, wet spring, uh, as we've had several years and unfortunately uh, seem to be tracking for this year as well. Uh, then, of course, you need to have a susceptible host. There are some differences in susceptibility, uh, which Wei Jing, I'm going to defer to you on, on that one with some of the more uh, resistant and susceptible varieties. Uh, not a lot of data to date, but you you can mitigate this disease by choosing carefully choosing or avoiding some varieties versus others. Um, and then the last but not least is trying to um, minimize the overhead irrigation. Uh, let me rephrase that. Minimize raids, rain by either growing things in a low tunnel, a high tunnel, or making sure that you're not using overhead irrigation and maybe using drip irrigation instead to try and make sure that you don't exacerbate those wet, humid conditions that drive the disease process. Okay. Um I will follow with um, Jenna. Jenna mentioned some of the um, host. Um, yes, the rare cultivars is very in their susceptibility to this disease. Um, we really see that last year because uh, we have a strawberry variety trial conducted at our farm. Unfortunately, we got this disease and uh, that. It's not my attention purpose, but do allow me to see how different um, different cultivars respond to this disease. So among the 10, yes, we have 10 strawberry cultivars evaluated last year. Um, the most susceptible cultivar, like that's the next AC Valley, Ruby June, and most of California cultivars in our trial, like Chadler, um, Camino Real, Camarosa, those are very susceptible. I would say our yield loss from this disease is even close to half of the fruit from those most susceptible cultivars. But we definitely see two cultivars, Flavor Fest and uh, Galata, did um, fairly well. Um, even under that very high disease pressures, I think our yield loss of those two varieties is probably less than 20%, um, roughly. But I, so, so I'm looking at the description of those cultivars. Yes, the breeders did say those cultivars have some kind of tolerance. They're not immune, they're not resistant completely to this disease. But if you grow those cultivars, uh, you might see less of the damage if, unfortunately, uh, this disease become a problem. Um, but another thing I do want to see is, I think it also depends on uh, the timing when those rain happens, when the high temperatures, and uh, how that overlaps with the bloom and the fruit set because all different cultivars, the, some is early bloom, some later bloom, so there are some difference. Um, and unfortunately that um, we cannot predict the weather when those rain happens. So that make um, this a little more complicated. And I would add to that, that the spring freezes that can damage uh, flowers, fruit and crowns also uh, exacerbates. Uh, so when those happen, that's another issue. So if you can keep the strawberries protected uh, under straw, um, or if you're doing any sort of high tunnel work, making sure that the tunnels are down so that uh, the plants stay warmer and don't suffer any freeze damage uh, also goes a long way to protect against anthracnose. And, and the same is true for bet botrytis as well. Okay. Yeah, um, actually, Jenna, since you, you mentioned the botrytis, maybe we can start talk a little bit more about botrytis. Um, okay. The, the, the same thing as, okay, can you tell us more about the basic biology of this passage? Yeah. Sure. So I, I don't think I've put a, uh, so here we go, just to make sure everybody is on the same page uh, regarding with what the pathogen looks like in some of its more extreme instances. Very similar to anthracnose, what could happen is you end up with blossoms that are damaged during a freeze. 
and this allows botrytis to get a toehold. Botrytis more often than not infects damaged tissue, whether the damage is freeze damage or where there might have been any sort of insect or bird damage or rodent damage. Um, this allows uh, botrytis, just like anthracnose, to, to get a foothold in there. And then once it gets in there, it ends up uh, spreading and continuing to infect, creating you know, either these uh, blighted uh, blossoms, blighted early fruit, or even working its way completely into the crown as well. Unlike anthracnose fruit rot though, when we talk about the disease triangle and the environmental conditions, botrytis prefers a more cool wet condition. So in those cool, wet springs, where we would expect to see a, a higher incidence of botrytis, and in the warm, wet springs, we'll see a higher incidence of anthracnose. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so it seems like both disease prefer wet condition, but anthracnose prefer warmer temperature, remote prefer cooler temperatures. Um. We cannot, unfortunately, control the temperatures. We don't know what kind of spring we will have, um, but it is possible to um, have some sort of protection to prevent rain if it's not a uh, too big of scale. For example, tunnels, no tunnel, high tunnels. Okay. Um, Jenna, I want to follow that. Is so uh, wait, you you mentioned earlier of award overhead irrigation um, that could be a culture practice we can do to prevent those disease yes. and we said a little bit about the different cultivars we can choose to prevent this disease is there any other culture practice you you can you can think about to um, reduce the loss before we move to fungicide sure i i I hate to bring this one up because it's it's such a, uh, but it has to be said, and I just want everyone to be aware. I understand exactly what I'm saying. Um, it really goes without saying that strawberries do much better in a sandier soil and not in our heavy wet clay, which is most of Indiana. So I think it's really important to recognize that when we put our strawberries in heavy wet clay, we are essentially setting them up for failure. So another thing that can be done would be um, if it is possible to tile, making sure the field that you're growing them in is tiled to improve drainage would be number one, or that the plants are bermed, raised up to also improve drainage. Those are, are two of the, the, I'm not gonna say easiest, but straightforward ways of uh, not having to rely on chemicals, um, but, produce positive outcomes um, with respect to disease management. Okay. The, the next would be the use of straw as a mulch. Um, I mean, we, we do call these strawberries for a reason. Um, they've been grown this way for several hundred years, which means empirically, um, generations of growers over time have recognized that using straw not only protects, you know, with freezes, but it also reduces the splashing. And remember, these fungi overwinter and reside in the soil. So if you can keep that splashing down by a layer of straw, it, it isn't going to solve everything, but it does go a long way in reducing your disease outbreaks. That's completely makes sense to me. Do, Gina, do you think uh, the plastic culture with plastic is also help in a similar way? Oh, that's a great question. And off the top of my head, I think if you're doing plastic culture and growing annual strawberries, absolutely. But I don't know how the data turns out over the course of several years. I, I, sus I know that over time, the plastic can also end up serving as a reservoir of disease. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Uh, because we're not washing the plastic, we're not surface sterilizing the plastic. Um, so, so there's that issue there. As far as how much better it is, I, I know that there's been a lot of work on this. I'm just not 
recalling what the ultimate outcome is between the, the different places. So I can look that up and get back to you with some of those references, though, if anyone is interested. Okay, thanks, Jen. I, I do believe I see some some research come out. See, um, it looks like with plastic, counter plastic covered bed, the botrytis problem is it's it's not as um it, it's less, but um I I I don't think it helped with astragnos um anyway. I even see some research say um plastic culture astragnos can. Even worse, I'm not really understand the rational behind it. It may be related to how the fungus spores spread. So, um, so on the, plastic. the spores yeah. can stick to plastic. So that's on straw, there's going to be a number of different microorganisms, some of which will be antagonistic to the Colototricum fungus. On plastic, Colototricum has this unique ability to adhere. And a lot of these other antagonists are going to be washed away. So in some ways, you could be selecting for a worse situation with uh, perennial strawberry production on plastic culture. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I think something we need really need to look into because um, we know the plastic culture really coming from the southern areas. Most of the farmers grow strawberry and plastic culture, and uh, and and it's an annual system, so we we don't need to worry about what's the plastic or all those things. But as the practice moving northern area in our regions, we start to look at like Dr. Steve Myers have this grant to look at the two year plastic culture system. Um, but when we are looking this culture system for a longer period, it, it's how that would affect the disease. I think it's a very interesting thing we should look into. Absolutely. Yeah. And you, you mentioned the straws. Um, I, I definitely see from my own experience of growing strawberry because my, my experience is mostly in plastic culture. And uh, um, before I did not do straws, between the rows, mm, so the between the rows is bare soil. Um, I think I see a benefit of adding straws between the rows. I think that prevent of the soil splash to to the plants. That makes sense. Um, anything else you want to add, Jenna, in terms of cultural practice before we move to fungicide? Uh, I guess one of the things, not so much cultural, but I think sometimes gets overlooked by me because I'm a plant pathologist and I'm only worried about the fungi, is how important insect, bird, and mammal management is to this. And just to reiterate, if the fruit or the blossoms or the plants are getting damaged in any way, and, and let's be clear, the big damagers are going to be insects, birds, and rodents. Uh, all of those provide uh, an avenue for the fungus to get into the plant. And so making sure that your insect control is, uh, that you're staying on top of it, outbreaks of like a tarnished plant bug uh, will definitely add to your anthracnose fruit rot problem. Outbreaks of thrips attacking your flowers will contribute to not just anthracnose, but also botrytis. So making sure that you have good insect management is really important uh, to keep your good disease management. That's a really good point, Jenna. Yeah, we are in the in the field, we're really dealing with a complex um, environment. It's, it's not just disease, all those potentially physical damage, insects damage could um, accelerate the disease problems, as Jenna said, yeah. Yep. Okay, and uh, and now we move forward and we know um, when environmental conditions, which we cannot control, um, are favorable for disease development. And uh, and if unfortunately the inoculant, the pathogen is present in the field, um, a, a fungicide program is almost essential to prevent a significant loss of from those diseases. 
And, uh, and now I want to discuss with Jenna about fungicide plans to prevent those diseases in the spring. Very fortunate, we have a grower, grow strawberry in plastic culture in southern Indiana. Um, very fortunate, we appreciate the grower share with us his um, fungicide <coughs> application record. His first fungicide application was right before, I, I confirmed with um, the grower, um, it's right before a peak bloom. And uh, he used the capivate that is in middle April. Then he followed a seven-day spray schedule, used um, pristine and captain. And the next spray, he used the lunar sensation and captain followed it. It's bad and toxin. And the last spray is switch and captain. So I um, want to take this opportunity to ask Jenna to comment on the fungicide plan in the and see how how the, this we want to use this real world example, and yeah. uh, hope, and the Jenna can help us understand more about the fungicide spraying principles and timings. So and how this grower can improve his program. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, first I want to thank the the grower for sharing this with us. Uh, I think anyone who's ever tried to grow strawberries for more than two or three seasons knows how absolutely. Uh, challenging it is and how many choices that you could make. And out of all of the choices that you could make, how what a small subset of correct choices you can make. You can make a lot of really wrong choices and uh, that uh, end up not providing you with optimum yield. So I want to talk about some of the things that when I look at what was provided to me here, and, and just keep in mind that you know, we're all learning and the goal is to make sure that we're better for this next year and we can come back and revisit this again in 2024 and, and see if things were better or, or not. Um, when I looked at the schedule and if I recall, when Jing, uh, this grower lost about half their crop to anthracnose. Does that sound? Uh, no, I, I, I don't know that. Oh, OK. Um, but I, I, I know he do um, had a uh, loss to France. Yeah, he was um, last year. OK, so he, he had obviously some significant loss because he was concerned enough to to bring this forward. And so I wanted to, to point out that by spraying starting at full bloom, that there were essentially at least three sprays timing wise that were missed depending on how you look at this. Um, I don't know if these were one-year-old plants that were planted in the fall or if these were in an established berry plot. So that's um, another issue here. There, there would have been an opportunity, which I, I'm not a big fan, okay? I want a point of disclosure here. Um, in the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide, we have um, the recommendations is, is sort of there, at least it's provided that at planting, you could actually dip the plants prior to to reduce disease. As this has been examined over the course of several years, uh, some researchers have found that it makes disease worse and other researchers have found that it makes, uh, it, that it improves management. Uh, I am not a big fan of the fungicide dip because if you start your dip process early on with something that happens to be infected, uh, it's very possible that you can spread everything to your subsequent dips. And so that's issue number one. Issue number two is you also then have a tank of fungicides you need to dispose of, uh, which is never a very good thing. So those are, are my two reasons that I am not a big fan of this, but if this is working for you, you know, don't mess with success. The next step is making sure that you actually spray early enough though. And this is a very difficult thing to time, especially in Indiana, because uh, right now uh, we are actually like seeing strawberries starting to grow. We are obviously very pre-bloom at this point, but it's, we could have a, I, I believe it was 2012 when we were in the nineties, mid-March, we could have a situation like that. There are other years where it could be mid-April. So we can't do this on calendar. We can only do this based on you going out and looking at your strawberry plants. And so right now, here's what I'm talking about by way of pre-bloom and when we probably wanna make sure that we get our applications on. Because 
all of the plants aren't perfectly synchronized at this stage. And so here you could see there's this one little, try and move this out of the way here. You can see there's this one little flower bud that's starting early here. And it's definitely possible that, you know, there could be thrips hanging out there. There could be mites hanging out there. Maybe a, a very early tarnished plant bug. Something could injure this bloom and provide that infection court. Um, just a few days ago, we were in the seven, you know, almost 70. Southern Indiana was in the 70s. Um, so here are some conditions that are, are warmer. And if it's followed with any sort of wetness, it can provide early infections that you want to protect against. So that's why this pre-bloom period is so important and that you actually uh, make sure you get that application. And, and that could be not just one or two, or not just one application, but you might have, you know, one, two, possibly even three before the bloom happens. It depends upon the weather condition. It depends on how heavily fertilized your plants are. Um, I always try and encourage growers to kind of step back on the fertilizer because over fertilizing plants makes them more susceptible to disease, not less susceptible. Um, you end up with a lot of very soft, uh, weak succulent growth. So making sure that your plants aren't over fertilized, going back to the previous one, making sure you have a fungicide on there before bloom or in that really early bloom is, is really critical. And I know in other disease systems and with strawberry, you can cut your losses significantly by making sure you get that additional application or maybe even two applications. So by saying that, then the, the next question is, what do I want to spray with? And here you can see, you know, I, I, I'm going to give you some suggestions, but there are a lot of options available. I know some of you are vegetable growers or you're growing other fruit crops. And so I don't want anyone to think that um, what I'm saying here is the only way. Uh, there are a lot of different approaches you can use to uh, develop a successful spray program. And if you're not sure about something, please feel free to reach out and I'm happy to look at it. And so at that early pre-bloom stage, um, because that could be a, a long extended period, particularly if the spring is cool, uh, and more cool than anything else, but cool and wet means it will take longer for the flowers to develop. It creates a situation that is uh, more conducive to botrytis. Um, and so you're gonna wanna spray every seven to 10 days. And that could be shorter intervals. The grower who shared their schedule with us was concerned uh, about if there was any fungicide left. We generally say for every inch of rain, you lose 50% of your fungicide. And so with two inches of rain, you lose 100%. Um, the other thing you want to keep in mind about your fungicide is you want to protect your new growth. So if you put your fungicide on your plant and then it's starting to produce new flower buds as it's growing and maturing, those new buds aren't protected. So you need to come back. That might be five days. It might not be seven if there was suddenly a warm snap and you have a, a big flush of blossoms. So it's, I wish I could give you a real simple calendar, but there's a lot of caveats that you want to keep track of. Um, early on, though, uh, I generally recommend the use of Captan uh, or Thyram. I think Captan has a slightly better management profile, but both of those, uh, you don't have to worry about disease resistance and you'll get very good, I would say pretty good control, very good to pretty good control for anthracnose crown rot. Um, You'll also be protecting against your leaf spots and your botrytis blight as well. Um, Captivate is no longer being manufactured, but if you have Captivate, that would also be a great one to use early on. If at the same time, I just wanna mention you're dealing with Phytophthora or you have a heavy wet soil or it's been a very wet season, making sure you get that early application of a phosphorus acid, Prophyte, Rampart, Vital, Kphyte, uh, are all in the same group of fungicides, all effective against Phytophthora or an application of Ritamil, just to keep that controlled. 
So that would be your, your very early pre-bloom. Later on, as the plant is starting to produce more of those blooms, you're going to really start to worry about your anthracnose fruit rot and your botrytis because even though the, the blooms look uh, really immature, anthracnose and botrytis doesn't care. So you want to make sure that you're protecting them, not just waiting until you have petals. Now, the petals are the most delicious things in the world to botrytis. Um, it's very uh, susceptible and everything else. But botrytis is going to get in any which way it can. So any sort of injury, any sort of freeze damage, um, it's going to try and find a way in. So you want to make sure that you get that application starting here, if not earlier, all the way through here to make sure that it's protected. If you wait till you're at full bloom, you've probably already had multiple infection events in an average year in Indiana. Why don't I pause there and see if there are any questions? I see that the chat was blowing up. Chat is about the organic options. I, could, I, could, I can go over this now. I'm gonna, uh, I'll, I will be, this is not a popular answer. Um, I don't deal in popularity. I try to deal with facts. Uh, in my experience in doing this for over 20 years, uh, growers who rely on organic disease management in the Midwest uh, tend to suffer more significant disease outbreaks than growers who rely on conventional controls. It isn't that the organic products don't work, it's that they don't work very well. And I know people don't like it when I say this, but uh, the Rodale Institute will confirm everything that I am saying. Um, none of us are happy about this, but this is the, the world that we operate within. Um, if you wish to do that route and try and go organic, you will need to be spraying your products, I would say every two to three days. Um, and then here's the catch 22, you're adding moisture to the system. So, and you're hitting the blossoms. If you do have disease and it's moist and warm and wet, or there's an injury, most of the organic products under high disease pressure will not protect. And that's when we see failures and usually very big failures. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot of data to support that, which is why I tend to focus in the Midwest on using the more conventional options. Yeah, I do want to add that. I do uh, feel folks um, are interested in growing organic strawberries. Um, it, it's probably more realistic to do that in a controlled environment um, that um, don't have um, rainfall in, the, um, in tunnels or greenhouse. It's probably more likely to um, achieve success. Of course, in those conditions, you may have to see different types of disease, um, but the management it would be different. Um, maybe if we have time at the end, we can talk about that. Um, but here, um, I will go back to um, follow what Jenna said. I do have a question, Jenna. You you mentioned earlier, like every single race, you lost a percentage of the fungicide. This is actually the question from one of the growers. He he typically sprays the fungicide before rains. Um, so so there's a protection there, but he's also worried the rains with the fungicide off um so do you think um it, do, do you have any recommendation here is that he should still um spray that before the rain forecasted i think it depends upon how much rain is going to be falling down if you're going to be getting more than two inches of rain like we just had uh last week uh, spraying just before something there, there's little point in spraying just before that if it's going to be that heavy uh, the problem is, is you want to then get out as soon as possible to get some of your sprays on that provide some kickback and to protect that growth. The problem being, if it's really wet, sometimes you can't get out there. Um, and I, I do recognize all of those issues. Um, and unfortunately, there just really isn't a good answer. And sometimes it's it's the, the answer is, is it's really hard and we have to accept a certain level of loss trying to do this in Indiana. 
um, because of our our challenge in climate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, then, Jenna, I, I have a few questions about how to how to look at the the um, the Midwest production guide. Are you going okay. to talk more about that, or or you want to? Ask well, I was gonna, I was going to walk walk them through and maybe go back and forth with the guide and everything else. Um, okay, so that sounds great. What, what did yeah. I do? Yes. So what I did here is I just wanted to walk through with like a, a mock up. And if people have the guide, they can they can look at it or they can download it later. And you know, this should be available to, to look at. You know, so I, I mentioned uh, at very pre bloom when you don't have a lot of uh, blossoms at all, um, that your disease pressures are low. But when you're getting into early bloom, it's going to be starting to uptick and you want to make sure that you're protecting your plants so infection doesn't get established. And this would be uh, early bloom just as you're starting to see those petals develop. And I want to make sure that we're clear. You know, we're, we're talking about this stage here right now. So we have white petals developing at this point and the weather is going to be getting warmer at this stage. And so our risk for anthracnose might be increasing, but again, this is spring in Indiana. So we also have this risk of botrytis at the same time. Um, so this would be my recommendation at this stage early on is to come at this with a 7-Eleven fungicide. And you could use, the most experience I have is with Marivon. Um, Luna Sensation is also a very good 7-Eleven. Pristine is an older 7-Eleven. Um, this will give you uh, good control against anthrac good to great control against anthracnose. Um, it will give you some protection against uh, botrytis. In the unlikely event you have any powdery mildew, it will help against that and also stop the establishment of your leaf spots. So it's an all-around really good product. Um, and then because we've used the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee FRAC code 7 and 11, we need to use a different number, okay? And now I'm gonna go and switch over to my spray guide to just show that. Um, so here is where we have these codes for you. And you could see that my next net recommendation was going to be uh, PHD or Elevate. So we had the 19 and the 17. And early on, you can see botrytis isn't even listed here because this is a pre-bloom issue. But when we get into bloom, when botrytis becomes an issue, it shows up in the guide. We have switch here mentioned as well, and I'm gonna talk about that. We have a lot of different options, but not all of them are good for managing our anthracnose crown rot. So your choices could be whittled down immediately by going after your most important disease problems first, and then going across to see, are there other problems that you need protection against? And so what I did is went in, used our guide, go back to my slides here. And in my assessment doing all of this, the product that gives me the broadest swath and the best protection at this critical stage, just before bloom, because we're trying to keep the disease incidence low, um, happens to be one of these 7-Elevens. Um, and then if this period is longer before we go into full bloom, hitting it with a FRAC 17 or um, a FRAC 19 or rotating to get control for either just botrytis, if maybe we don't have a problem with anthracnose, um, if we have a product with uh, a problem with both, we might want to go with PhD. If price is an issue. There are other options available to you and you'll have to break down these prices here, but you could make your own quote unquote 7-Eleven. Maybe you wanna have a little bit more 11 than you do seven or vice versa. Uh, all of these seven products individually are outstanding, which is why they are separate products. They're not tank mixed with something else. And so you could in some ways create a better 7-Eleven on your own if you if you're into that, I don't think most of us are. I mean, I think I might be the only human being into that, just to be really clear. I think you have to be a plant pathologist for this one. But I want to put that out there so you understand what's going on. Okay. I don't want to slight, though, and this would be another possibility, the Miravis Prime. It's a great new product. 
Um, this uses our, our flutioxinol, uh, which is an excellent Botrytis product, along with an, a, a new SDHI. Um, it just changes the, the nature of the rotation because you can't rotate a 711 with a 712. So you have to be cognizant of that situation. So you can do this. You will get also excellent control, but it does change a little bit about it. So you want to make sure that if you are using Miravis Prime, you don't use Maravon, Luna Sensation, or Pristine because you're double dipping on the seven. All of these will give really good disease control um, just before we get into that super critical full bloom period. Okay. Um and I guess before we go to that super important boom period, um, I, I think majority of our listeners understand what is um, FRAC means, um, the importance of rotate different groups. Um, just in case someone not familiar with that, Jenna, can you just briefly um, explain it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. FRAC um, stands for Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. It is an organization of industry, uh, develop, fungicide developers, uh, extension scientists, uh, industry scientists came together recognizing that we needed to do a better job educating growers how to make long-term sustainable management choices. Uh, it's It was observed very early on that a grower could, for very obvious reasons, say, well, I'm rotating my chemistry. I'm not just using Maravon over and over. I'm rotating Maravon with Luna Sensation or Pristine um, or even Miravis Prime, thinking that because they've changed the chemistry, they or because they've changed the name of the product, they've changed the chemistry, when in fact these chemistries work in the case of seven, uh, work in the same way. So you can't keep applying a fungicide classified as a seven over and over, even though the name is different because fundamentally the fungus only sees it as a seven. So it was a way of labeling fungicides so growers can readily recognize that these groups act in the same way. And so you want to rotate out of the groups to have an effective rotation. Yes. Okay, so Jenna, if I understand what you have been described in this pre prune um, period, um, group seven and eleven, it's most effective. And the frac seven plus eleven basically means this product have two group of fungicide mixed. Is that my understanding right? You said that far better than I did. Yes. <laughs> Okay, and uh, Jenna said like you can mix your own. Basically, means you use two different kind of fungicide. One is in seven, one is in eleven. If you want to do that, to do your own. But there are some product like lunar cessation, pristine. It's already a two group fungicide together. Okay, okay. Now, Jenna, we move to the most super critical time. Most super critical, and that most super critical because of not just anthracnose, but also botrytis. Um, and, and that's when we go to bloom. And so here's where we want to talk about our one application of Roverall. If we only have one, we want to make sure we're using it to really knock down our botrytis. Um, want to, can somebody double, Miranda, could you double check? Because I just want to make sure I was doing this off the top of my head that this isn't too late of an application because I, I want to make sure I'm not giving you the wrong information. And I had some computer issues before we got together. So um, assuming this is kosher at this time, you're only allowed one application. I believe Bloom is the latest, but I'm doing this from my very faulty brain. Um, this would be the time to use it. Nothing knocks down Botrytis like Roverall, assuming you don't have resistance. So you want to make sure you deploy it at this time. You can't deploy deploy it any later. Um, since you are going to probably have an extended period of bloom, whether you are using ever-bearing strawberries where you have constant blossoms coming, which I know most of us don't do, but if you do, um, or we have a long, cool season where you have a period of bloom, you're going to have to rotate with something else. And so using switch or making a switch to switch 
before you go back to that 7-Eleven is really important. And here you can see we're using our fungicide resistance action committee, our FRAC code nine and 12. And this is the main reason I don't like using Miravis Prime as much because we have this, we would be double dipping on our 12s now. So uh, if you did go with Miravis Prime, here's the time when you can rotate over to a 7-Eleven though. So it's just a different way of looking at things. There are a lot of other different ways of looking at things. And you can see where I have certain overlaps with the, the less commonly used botrytis specific fungicides like Roverol, which is a FRAC2, like PHD, which is a FRAC19, or um, uh, not switch, uh, Elevate, which is a FRAC17, that, you know, these more botrytis specific fungicides. And so this way you've really uh, deployed multiple FRAC codes and hopefully has not only managed the disease at the most critical time, but also managed your fungicide resistance as well. Mm -hmm. At this stage, then you can come back with another application of, and this would be your second application of Merivin or Luna Sensation or Pristine. Uh, I like to finish things off at the very end, a final application. I, I found this works very well on apples. And similarly with uh, strawberries as well, is finishing up with a 7 and 11 after this last switch, if the timing warrants it, um, in that it helps against some of the post-harvest rots. But it is also, if, if strawberries are going quickly and they're not sitting around on the, the plant, you can skip that final 7-Eleven application after your switch application there as well. Going over to Miravis, we start back from the beginning yet again. We use another application of Miravis. If we need to continue, which we probably will because the season usually is a little bit more than a month. I would say it's more like six weeks to eight weeks. You're gonna go in and rotate with a FRAC 17 or a FRAC 19. And then you can go back to a 7-Eleven or something else to finish up as well. One last point, which I've not had um, any of the growers talk to me recently, are issues with Phomopsis blight, um, Mycosphorella, or Diplocarpin. These are some of our foliar disease problems. Usually those become more of an issue after harvest, but if they do come earlier and it builds up over time, um, this is when you want to bring in a FRAC3 fungicide. And I'm going to go back and show you this. So when we go farther down, this is pre-bloom, disease management during bloom, you can see over here, we have uh, several diseases that might start to rear their ugly little heads just after, um, just as fruit starts to develop. And some of the fungicides that you might wanna consider using at this time would be anything from a Procure to a uh, Rally, or um, top guard is a three plus 11. I'd be careful if you're using your 11s in other ways. Uh, premixes are a, a big, we need to be cognizant of the premixes. They make our lives easier in many ways, but they do um, tend to create problems when we are doing our rotations. And if we aren't carefully looking at these frac codes, we can end up double dipping in a mode of action and actually creating resistance issues uh, in our berry patches. So um, always double check what your frac code is before uh, you end up applying anything to make sure that you didn't get an accidental uh, 11 slipping in there or an accidental seven slipping in in your frac codes. Okay, so Jenna, those three leaf disease, it's more likely to happen after harvest is that I'm correct? So the I, folks. I would say in most in most years, yes. But if you have a, a warm, wet year, uh, or if you've been planting in the same location over many years and the diseases have built up, uh, we have had instances where people have had some significant losses because of more for Phomopsis and Mycosphorella. Okay. 
So for folks going strawberry for multiple years, metular role system, perennial system, they need to watch for this disease after harvest. Maybe have the another fungicide and spray for that. Um, for growers have the annual system, and um, that probably less of a concern. Is is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, Jenna, we only have two minutes left. I, um, and I, I, I do want to ask you this question. Yes. I, I know some of the strawberry growers are in much smaller scale. Um, they probably do not have the capability to have multiple fungicides uh, available for them to rotate. Um, in those cases, if, if you could, if they only can spray one or two times in the season, or they only have one fungicide, or two, um, they are able to stock. <laughs> um, yeah. What, yeah, what would that's... be your recommendation for those situations? Well, and, and again, for those situations, uh, are, I mean, are we talking backyard growers or are these going to be a little bigger than backyard growers? Mm, I, I think backyard grow probably won't really spray fungicide. I do think in those Commercial growers, they do uh, sell strawberries and uh, want to have a good yield. I, I, I know it's it's a risk. Even you cannot do an intensive fungicide program. Yeah. yeah, so for the backyard growers, the big things are going to be using the more resistant varieties, making sure they're adequately spaced, really staying on top of the weeds, making sure plants don't get overgrown so your airflow is there, so the plants are drying. Um, Captan, usually it's Captan 50 WDG is available in some locations for home growers. And that would be one of the products that would I would recommend the most. Um, I believe that uh, they still produce, I know they still produce a multi-purpose fruit spray, which contains Captan and usually several insecticides. Not my first choice, but for the backyard grower, there aren't a lot of options available. Um, Bayer also has a three-in-one fungicide and insecticide they might want to look into, but I don't know much more about that than that. My um, appointment is with commercial growers, so it's it's hard to, to cover everything. So I apologize that we do have the Midwest Home Fruit Pest Management Guide, uh, which has all of that information in there. Um, I think the biggest challenge is trying to find the products, thankfully, the, the internet's made that a lot easier. Thanks, Jenna. And the last thing from our um, chat, um, will you be able to share with your slides with us? Um, sure, after I can send them. I'll send them okay. to you right after this. Okay, then we will um, put it somewhere and include a link in the description of our podcast. Sounds good. We are at the end of our program, Jenna. We are so appreciate you come here to talk to us <laughs> about this, the whole thing and um, and the, those information. Are, we we understand it's very critical for um, our strawberry growers. Like everyone is thinking of the, this problems right now, so we are really appreciate you take time to um, help us understand this situation better. Yeah, my pleasure.